Hiya 10. Well done for your work so far on Afro Celt Sound System release. Uh, you've done the background knowledge from BBC Bite Size. Um, and you've also completed a task on instrumentation, looking at all the instruments in detail, listening to those instruments on YouTube so you get a really good idea of the timbre of those instruments. And then you've put them into a table so that you can uh, know which instrument goes into which culture um, and musical genre so that we can see all three fusions. We can see the African element, we can see the Western pop dance music element and we can also see the Celtic influences as well. So great for doing that. Today what we're going to do is we're going to look in more detail at the actual um, piece of music uh, and I'm just going to basically go through it. We're going to listen and I'm going to stop and I want you to be able to identify alongside me what you can hear because actually that's the best way of trying to analyse this set work I think. Um, on Google Classroom I have put a table which is a timeline of the whole piece and it's really useful, it's from the textbook it goes through what you can hear at, at each different time but I think we want to add a little bit more detail to that especially in terms of our musical elements such as tonality, texture, melody, rhythm all of those different elements okay so we're going to make a start by just talking briefly um, one of the things you missed some of you was talking about the voices when you looked at the instruments now of course we have Sinead O'Connor who uh, although she has an Irish background um, actually is the kind of western pop element of the piece then we have um, the Irish singer as well the male voice and he is Leonard, he is the kind of, obviously the Celtic influence. And then of course there was the third voice, which was the African voice, which was uh, um, spoken by the griot. Now the griot, remember, is basically a, a teacher in Africa and he's a storyteller. And so we hear right at the beginning the griot speaking um, and that's a really important influence from the African element of it. So don't forget that word griot, really important word. Okay, we'll hear that straight away when we hear it. So we're going to listen to Afro-Celt and then I'm going to stop it as we go and describe what we can hear and hopefully you can do the same by looking at the table that is uploaded onto Google Classroom. Please do also have your anthology here which has got all of these different loops and we're going to decipher which loop we can hear and when as well okay here we go so just the first the opening we're going to listen to the uh, first 48 seconds I lied a little bit because I'm stopping that a little bit prematurely. That first thing we can hear is a synthesizer and it's a synth pad and it's droning and can you hear that it's moving from one speaker to another, it's panning and we can hear this sound going from side to side, it feels like a filter sweep. Um, it's a really fantastic technique to make that sound move all around us. Um, it's also got a, a keynote, which is a C, a pedal of C, and it's giving us a real grounding of C tonality. Okay, That doesn't mean we're necessarily in C major or C minor. There's no way of telling from just that note, but it is giving us a feeling of a tonal centre of C. Okay. Now, this next instrument that we can hear is the talking drum so the african element here alongside that synthesizer which is the western instrument um, and we all know that you've done a bit of research on the talking drum we also know that it's played with a stick but we can also hear different pitches from the talking drum because you can adjust it by tightening and loosening the skin through the the ropes at the at the side of the drum so you can hear that talking drum can you hear that it doesn't really have a rhythm it's very random and it's certainly not creating a meter at the moment. No time signature, it's a very free meter at this point. Okay, you also might have heard the shaker that was introduced at that point. Again, it's not a shaker how we'd expect it perhaps in Western pop music. It's just literally a random shake, um, probably creating a, a more of a feel of the African music that we might know of. Okay, so no pulse at all. 
is not clear until 48 seconds or um, the, where the boron comes in, okay, which is the Irish drum. So here we go, more shaker, more synthesizer, more talking drum. Now we're going to hear one thing, which is going to be an a African voice. Okay, so we hear, heard that African griot voice, that's also the Kora player, um, and the Kora, remember, is that African harp-like instrument, but the most important thing at this point is that we can hear that griot voice speaking, um, so be very aware that that's coming from that African element. Okay, and he's obviously speaking, not singing, but then we get the boron come in, and remember that this is the, the uh, Irish drum, and finally we have a rhythm, a pulse, to kind of hold on to, and we get 12 bars of that, we've already heard one of those, so we'll keep going. Now over the top of this, I'll just turn it down slightly, I want to draw your attention to loop one in the book, where it says boron, and this is the loop that that boron is playing for 12 bars. Right, now I'm going to stop it there. Um, obviously this, this little uh, rhythm from the boron is slightly syncopated, it's slightly off the beat. Uh, if you look at the latter half of each bar, you can see that's a little syncopated rhythm. It's quite a complex rhythm, it's funky, it gets, it gets it, the, the piece really, really going. Um, I was going to say something else, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, the word loop. So now, the word loop means a repeating pattern that goes over and over again. And I know you know that from composing dance music on things like... Um, um, you know, I think things uh, for fruity loops and 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 uh, software like that. So um, a loop is just a repeating phrase, um, and that's obviously we've got lots and lots of loops going on there. So this is the boron one. Now at uh, one minute seventeen seconds, we hear the cora come in. Okay, so now from your research into the cora, you know that this is the Western uh, West African string instrument. Okay, it looks like a harp and a loop, but it sounds very similar to a guitar sound. So let's listen out for that. And there's also some additional uh, instrumentation that is uh, in this next eight bars. <laughs> Okay, so we've got the Cora and Loop 9, but also, um, can you hear that the voice has already been introduced? Now, that is not on your table, so Sinead O'Connor is already what we call vocalising. She's not singing kind of words, the odd word here and there, but really it's nonsensical. So um, we call that a vocalisation, it's just ooing and ahhing, and that is not on the table, so you can add that onto your table. Now that's in preparation for where we go to 1 minute 38 verse 1. This is where she's introducing the words that are on page uh, 76 of your anthology, uh, where it says figure 2. She's going to start singing a repetition of um, three, three verses, basically. So uh, here we go. <laughs> and just quickly analyse the melody at this point. So I want you to try and think, first of all, of the words that come completely to mind as soon as you think of melody. So I'll just give you a sec. Hopefully that's come up in your brain as to whether it's ascending or descending. Well, clearly these all descend and then they just ascend slightly at the end, but the main, the majority of the melody goes down, doesn't it? So it descends. Don't argue amongst yourself because of the loss of me. So they're all descending. 
You could also call them repetitive. They're the same phrase over and over again, so four times, and then obviously then the whole verse repeats as well, but with different words, and we call that strophic. Um, usually it's used in more traditional music, but it's still the same idea, strophic meaning that it's the same verse, music, but with different words underneath it. Okay, also just quickly to say, say about the rhythm, da, 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 you have that little anticipatory um, syncopation before the second bar of each of those phrase, two bar phrases. Again, two bar phrases, that's quite important as well if we're talking about the phrase length, the structure. So there's lots of things we can talk about there. One of those things also is the idea of um, the tonality. Now, if you look at the key signature, we've already said that we've got this tonal centre of C. Can you see that the key signature says C minor? B flat, E flat and A flat. If we go back to the penultimate flat, E flat, that means it's E flat major. We know it's not E flat major. So if we go down three semitones, we get to C and then we start to realise, ah, this is sort of C minor-ish. But one thing you'll notice is that there's B flats, but there's no B naturals as that raised seventh of C minor in the actual score. Now, if you transfer the notes that are being used, C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, and C, onto an A, okay, we find that actually that would mean that all of those, those pitches moved on to A, or that tones and semitones order, would make A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, all white notes. So actually, this melody that Sinead O'Connor is singing is in the Aeolian mode, Remember modes? These come from the Renaissance era, before major and minor was even born. Um, it's an Aeolian mode, white notes from A to A, but moved on to the notes of C, which result in C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, and C. So we would call Sinead O'Connor's melody here Aeolian mode, but on the note of C, okay? So that is the tonality of this section, so I hope you've understood that. Now the one big thing I think is important to highlight here is that that is a good link to the idea of Celtic folk music, because Celtic folk music is one of the genres that uses modes still today, okay? So classical music went away from modes, and because we had major and minor born, but actually folk music is so traditional that it's it's retained that element of modality. So that's a really good link to say that the tonality is uh, an example of the um, folk element, the Celtic folk element. All right, so we're going to carry on with that. We're going to carry on listen to the second repeat of Sinead O'Connor singing figure two. Can you hear the effects that she's got on her voice? You can hear there's a lot of reverb going on at this point. Think about the instruments you can hear accompanying her that aren't actually outlined in the, the table. Could you hear that there was definitely the synthesised sound there? And that would be the chords, I think, from loop four that are coming in there. So we definitely see the soft synth pad, or, not, or hear the soft synth pad, okay? I also think, although it's not in the table, as it says the instrumentation gradually builds up, I think you can already hear the hurdy-gurdy, that kind of quite harsh sound, but it's all on one note, a pedal note again. But you can just hear that sound, that element, that timbre of the hurdy-gurdy, not doing anything at the forefront of the texture yet, but just just in the background there. Um, so there's definite element of, of building that texture up. So remember when we're talking about texture, we said there's a build up over the repeats of the verse. Now the final bit you'll see, two minutes 15, there's an eight bars and it says with an ascending chromatic line from G to B flat. Listen to that bass line, which is actually highlighted on loop 10 at the top of page 79. And it's really chromatic G to A flat to A natural to B flat. At the end, the third version of each, the third repeat of each of these verses, even when um, the Irish singer sings as well, uh, the male voice, we always hear this, this uh, chromatic ascending bass line. So listen really carefully for it the third time. Now, 
I'm just going to stop it there because did you hear on the last seventh, the seventh and the eighth bar of that, there was a break in the texture. It was became much lighter and lots of the instruments would drop out. We call it a breakdown or a drop out. So the texture kind of goes like this, builds, 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 and then suddenly goes like that. And we hear also in the recording technique that it just kind of lets the echo and so then those instruments continue so we kind of have this kind of airy sound and it makes us know that something new is going to happen which at 2 minutes 34 happens and this is the break now we know in pop songs that we can kind of quite often have a break it's usually a we call it a bridge section in pop songs um, or maybe sometimes even a middle eight but here the break is because there is a break in the texture and there's also a break in the in the verse singing material so we're going to hear some instruments. Let's see if you can identify those. Okay, so hopefully you could hear the bass, loop 12, playing there. Okay, also, can you hear the breath samples, a slightly um, obscure sound, but the... So we've got the breath samples of loop 13 going on there at that point as well. Um, you obviously got drums as well. Here we go, let's see, see if we can hear anything else. Can you hear those little whistles as well, additional whistles? I'm not sure whether that's done as a synthesised sound or whether it's the tin whistle that we're going to hear later on, but uh, it's definitely a whistle sound, isn't it? Uh, that's definitely the tin whistle. And then you can also hear the boron again, obviously, the Irish drum carrying on, um, keeping that really strong beat going on. Okay, right, let's go to lead into verse two. Now, verse two, as you'll see, if you go back to page 76, is figure three. And this is the male voice. He's singing in Gaelic. So we've obviously got the difference between the English, Sinead O'Connor's uh, kind of Western link, and then obviously the Gaelic here for the, for the Celtic link. Um, so figure three we're going to hear. See if you can work out whether he's, he is actually singing the same as um, Sinead O'Connor, whether he's singing something different. And also think about the phrase lengths in both of those verses, the female verse and the male verse, and see if you think it's any difference. Here we go. that's the third the repetition could you hear the bass guitar is just like just coming in not the bass guitar sorry the bass synth is just coming in at that point we're going to hear that chromatic as chromatic ascent again but i want to go back to this idea of whether he's singing the same thing or whether the phrase lengths are um similar now you heard this da 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 in Sinead O'Connor's and Leonard goes da 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 so it's pretty much the same it's got that descent and then that slight ascent at the end it follows the same uh, pitches um, just slightly different in terms of the rhythm for the first two phrases and then can you see that when we get to this first time bar here of Leonard's um, uh, first verse can you see that he's split those phrases slightly different and the rhythm has changed and the pitch has slightly changed although he's using the similar notes the pitch has changed slightly now in the second verse in his repeat of that where it goes to a second time bar there's a second time bar for a reason and the reason for that second time bar is that he does change it considerably on the second time so it needs a second time bar it can't just be a repeat of what we've heard already and he changed it quite significantly in that you get in and then he goes da 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 again so it is changed so now we would call Sinead O'Connor's um, rendition of her three uh, repeats of the verse we could call them regular phrases because they're regular two bar phrases and they're basically repetitive whereas Leonard what he does is he kind of contrasts that and he develops it and they become irregular so he's a irregular phrase length so there's the contrast between the two although they're using similar notes similar rhythms 
Leonard's becomes more improvised, shall we say, and definitely more a regular phrase length. Now, we've got to the third repeat then of that. So I'd just like to draw your attention to figure four, which is that, that repeat. And I also want you to hear that synthesized bass loop again that ascends uh, loop 10 in this section. Here we go. Could you hear there? So we had the ascending bass line, the chromatic bass line, we had the figure four male voice this time, so not an re exact repeat of, of figure three, but also did you hear that big drop out again at the end of that section? So the bass drops out and we hear um, a sort of kind of again an echoey sensation. And that's preparing us for the next section, which are the solos. So at 3.51, it's the first time that we hear the Yulian pipes and the tin whistle. Now remember the Yulian pipes are the Irish version of bagpipes. The so Scottish bagpipes, um, we blow, or you, not I don't because I don't play them, but you'll see that people blow the bagpipes and you can see they quite require a lot of puff to keep that going. And, and also people tend to circular breathe so they don't need to take actually air in. Um, apart from the first breath but actually the Yulian pipes have a softer feel to them they're, they, they sound like bagpipes but they're slightly more gentle and a softer feel and the reason for that is that actually the air is uh, like bellows so you actually use your elbow to actually uh, make the air in those Yulian pipes and that's why it's called Yulian pipes because they're called because uh, that means elbow okay so it's Gaelic for elbow so the elbow pipes so listen out for that different sound slightly than the perhaps the more well-known bagpipes that you know and then you'll also hear that there's doubled by the tin whistle for the second lot of four bars at this point now I'm going to play it to you and then we're going to talk about the tonality being slightly different at this point okay second four bars tin whistle doubling two can you hear that the bar Three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Now at this point we've got the eight bars of the low whistle as well, so the low tin whistle comes in and we're going to get this ascending chromatic bass line again. It says the bass drops out and the borum part is much simpler and sparser at this point. So listen out for the borum being slim, simpler than before. Okay, that's the uh, uh, Irish drum. Here we go. <laughs> Baseline from loop 10 again. Can you hear the borrowings more simple here? The, the low tin whistle is the important thing at this point. Now, I'm going to stop and let's just draw our attention back to the tonality. Now, you'll think, you might think at figure five, when we look at this Julian pipe solo that they've just played there, and then lower where it says whistle 8VA higher and also low whistle figure six, which is the second lot of eight bars. Um, obviously, to look at those solos, we would probably suggest that they'd be improvised. Don't forget that this piece of music is highly unlikely it would have been written down like this. Okay, these this anthology has been put together for you. So very similar to something like Samba and Preludio when you come to do that one. Um, it will be improvised as we go and so therefore it's been written down for you so that you can actually analyse it in detail and you're able to kind of um, find different details within the score but remember this would be improvised, it would be made up as it goes along uh, based on just a particular scale. Um, can you see that the rhythm at this point, okay, is quite complex in, uh, in terms of challenging but it's actually very repetitive in the Yulian pipe solo and in fact the whistle solo that's important as well, at the glissando at the end of figure five. Um, so a slide there, musical technique, instrumental technique. But when the low whistle comes in with its improvisation, figure six, um, can you see that it's using triplets and sextuplets as well? And we also get demi semiquavers as well. So it becomes even more what we might call virtuosic. Remember, all of these players, performers, have been picked because they are the top of their game within their musical cultures. And they've all come together as this collective rather than, we don't call it a band, they're just a collective of musicians that are amazing in their field. 
So it's a very, very complex rhythm, figure six. Um, and again, we get in slight syncopation at different points um, and little ornaments as well, little achachiatura, these grace notes, um, which just makes it really, really exciting. OK, now the other thing I said was the tonality. Now, it's looked so far that, again, we're still in C minor. Um, but actually, that's not really the case. We've already said that the vocal melodies were Aeolian mode, but on C, and I explained why that was. But actually, at this point, if you look at the melody, this is something you probably wouldn't do unless you were asked to do. Can you see that there is a, an absence of A's in those improvisations? OK, now, because there is no A, we can sort of presume uh, one way or the other that it might in fact then be an A natural. Okay, now if we look at that, we can decide that possibly this, this solo is actually not in the Aeolian mode on C. If we say that it is an A natural, not an A flat, we now have that scale of C, D, E flat, F, G, A natural, B flat and C. Now if you put that on to all white notes, you'll find that it actually corresponds with the white notes from D to D. D, E, F, which is the flattened third, like the E flat, G, A, B, C sharp, or sorry, C natural, and D, which is the flattened seventh C natural. Okay, so if that's the case, then actually what this solo is, is more orientated to Dorian mode. That's the tonality between D and D white notes. So again, it's another example of modality being used as a folk element. Okay, so... Uh, make a note that the Yulian pipe solo, the whistle solos, are in the Dorian mode, but again on C. So it's not the, it's not Dorian mode per se, but Dorian mode on C. Okay. Now, obviously, I can explain that in a little bit more detail when we're at school, but just for now, hopefully that that will uh, be a, a simple explanation to you. Okay. So let's continue. We'll go on to the break at four minutes twenty nine, where we have two bars of repeated vocal sample and the accordion rhythm as a main driving force, while most of the other parts drop out. It's the first time you've actually heard the accordion at the forefront. So here we go. It's another break down in the texture. You hear the accordion going there with the lovely syncopated rhythm. OK, let's see if we can find that accordion. Uh, where are we? Yes, down lo loop 17 at that point. We're hearing, hearing that. Uh, can you see the accents are on um, the first and the fourth of the semiquavers, which creates this da 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 that nice uh, kind of off-kilter feeling, OK? So that's that. And then, here we go, we're going to then move into an eight-bar hurdy-gurdy solo. Gurdy Gurdy solo is loop 20. Now I think that might be the griot singing over the top of there, the griot voice, the African voice, rather than the um, the Gaelic or the English voice, okay, the female male voice. I think it's the um, griot sound at that point. Um, and you heard the Hurdy Gurdy solo from loop 20, again, using really complex, very, very virtuosic rhythms, okay? Um, it's a really distinct sound, that Hurdy Gurdy, isn't it? Okay, remember, if, hopefully you've read about it and you've seen it being played, but you obviously turn the wheel that then makes um, an almost like a bow action against the strings to create that sound, even though you don't actually play the bow like you would on um, a violin or a cello um, and obviously then you you create you decide what notes you're going to play with this hand so you've got that kind of drone sound that's very very um, typical of the hurdy-gurdy all the way through that so good so that's the hurdy-gurdy solo then we go on to verse three now at this point we're going to hear the same second line of the first verse with O'Connor singing but the hurdy-gurdy solo is continuing in the background <laughs> Same as Sinead O'Connor was singing before. So essentially.
essentially what that's doing in terms of texture is creating a contrapuntal or maybe, maybe even a polyphonic texture. Either really would, would explain it. Polyphonic meaning many melodies at the same time. Um, contrapuntal is a bit more formal in that it's two or more melodies of equal importance. But I would intend to call this polyphonic at this point because there are going to be many, many melodies all layered over the top of each other as we go through this verse. Um, all being loops, all these repeated phrases all the way through, creating what is very similar to dance music. If you listen to dance music, that's what it does. It creates these textures, um, layering textures of loops over and over again and building up and then it breaks down. So there you've got a really integral part of the influence from the Western dance pop music. The texture is, is very important linked to that. OK, so here we go. Now this time when we hear it, we're going to hear the Yulian pipes added as well. And then this time we hear the synth chromatic line again because we know that it's coming to an end that verse because of that chromatic ascent. But also, can you hear that it's changed to Leonard's voice as well? So Sinead O'Connor's kind of stopped and the uh, Gaelic voice has come in. Chromatic bass line. You can also hear the accordion on a kind of an echo. find quite fascinating about this is is the piece you can imagine kind of goes like this really on a on a grand scale so we might expect that when we get to this section which is the outro um, we might expect it to do the opposite to what the introduction did the introduction gradually built up the texture so I might have expected the outro to kind of gradually go away perhaps to a, a much sparser texture at the end even maybe a monophonic texture of just one instrument however it doesn't what it does is it does a massive breakdown um, at 550 just before that okay before the, the the bit before the outro and then it starts building all the way up again until you've got all of these loops going on at the same time making a polyphonic texture and then it just finishes um so it, it's quite interesting in terms of that so we're gonna have this big build up again but very very again dance like so we had a big breakdown and now we're going to gradually add the instruments as we go here we go for the outro Bass guitar first, Boron, and the drum loop that is on uh, the page here, where are we? Uh, 14. And then can you hear that little loop there? Now that's the that's that kind of piano, electric piano sound at that point, synthesized sound, electric piano. That's uh, number 25, loop 25. Very syncopated, these both very off the beat, very funky. Now that electric piano drops out, and we hear the hurdy gurdy coming back again, and it's also going to be accompanied what I said was vocalese. Here we go. Can you hear those little Sinead O'Connor vocalese? And now we're going to have the Julian pipes coming again. Playing the same thing as the hurdy gurdy, actually. Now, this time, there's a very subtle version of that chromatic bass line, so it's not as obvious this time. Perhaps they don't want to make you think this is, is going to another section, perhaps it's because it's going to end. Here we go. So. Everything is getting buried, as it says, under these ostinatos. Ostinato just means a repeating pattern. But all these loops, I think we should call them, perhaps going over and over again to create this really chaotic polyphonic texture, but a chaos that actually works beautifully together. And then we're going to come to the final eight bars that carry on looping, everything going over and over again with the third line of verse one and the ascending chromatic line. But it's got this beautiful fade out where it just literally leaves those interweaving loops to kind of just carry on with a reverb echo kind of uh, sensation just until they disappear, massive diminuendo at the end. Um, here we go.
electric counterpoint actually that sound they've got lots of guitars recorded and uh, as a minimalist texture with a live entry over the top okay super let me just stop that so there's a lot to take in there what I would like you to do is to make sure you've got that table from the Google classroom um, if you can print it out that would be really really helpful if you can't please can you try and make your own timeline like that so you could do your own table and you could write it out and add everything to be honest that might be the best way to do it for everybody because actually it means you can add all the information that i've given you on top of what's already in the table okay do keep referring to the anthology with the loops and the figures in there so you can see the melodies that are being played with all the way through and the final thing i've done i've uploaded to the google classroom is on uh, i've uh, on the music technology that's been used in this piece of music as well so it talked about uh, stereo fields it also talks a bit more about the synthesizers used and obviously about loops so hopefully that is the well, it's definitely plenty for this lesson today um so please get on with that now um and then well you'll have done it i'm sure as you've been listening to this and then and do have a look at those pages that i've uploaded to the google classroom okay and thank you very much bye <laughs>